Lovely. So, Stuart, over to you. Thank you, Richard. So, thank you for having me back again. I, I seem to have been the, be the poster highlights guy. I don't know why, but anyway, it seems to have happened. It happened in COVID, and it's still here. So you've got me again. So um, uh, I, I, I'm following, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. There's an amazing talk there uh, with wonderful depth and breadth, uh, getting right into a subject. And this is quite the opposite. Okay, uh, so this is going to be pretty light and quick, and you'll be in tea before you know. Uh, so that's uh, me, and I've got no declarations of interest. Uh, so, uh, as I say, it's like a collection of good short stories. Uh, I'm going to be highlighting slightly random bits. So this isn't necessarily the best posters, far from it. There's some wonderful other posters out there. It's just weird bits that stood out to me. Okay. Um, there's 111 posters. That's the most that I can ever remember us having. It's amazing. It's an amazing effort from the whole community. So much going on. Uh, I think it's really positive. And we've got them from all over the world. So there's posters from India, Oman, Dubai, and in the UK, from Glasgow, Southampton to Swansea, all around. So, um, uh, so a, a great mix, including all staff groups and a wide range of topics. So there's something out there for everyone. So getting straight into it, um, uh, this is a, 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 a really nice, uh, well put together poster from uh, the Royal Surrey. Um, <clears throat> so they had an issue with um, contamination uh, training. It, it, you, can see the problem, uh, throwing some technician around the department and then walking around the department uh, creates some radiation problems uh, for your staff. Um, and so how do you practice this stuff? So they use tonic water uh, and uh, UV light to train for, uh, train for large spill clear up. Um, they <clears throat> said the UV light was uh, a little bit difficult um, because uh, you, they had to um, make sure they didn't cross any regulations with uh, UV light. And uh, to do it, if I can just get the they had to dress up like this to cover their arms and face. Uh, I hope he's got some sun cream on his forehead there, but they've got some shades on and a face mask. Uh, so that's a slight pain. Um, and they had to purchase a torch. But apart from that, um, they think this is pretty good. So they got some tonic water filled water bombs right, and thrown, uh, thrown that down here. Uh, and then they've tried to clear it up. When you turn the lights on, it disappears. Uh, and you go back to UV and you can see that you've walked it through the department. It's not gone terribly well. Uh, and all of that without creating any radiation. And uh, then they look at the pros and cons of using this as a technique, which is quite nice down in this bottom corner. And overall grade this as a 6 out of 10. Uh, so quite, quite a good way of doing this. Uh, and so I would uh, agree with that. So staff dose is something that should be uh, close to all of our uh, hearts. I'm also the radiation protection lead for the uh, Royal College of Radiologists, and I sit on the Radiation Protection Committee. And so uh, this is something that I think about. And with lots of work being classified, uh, lots of our techs are being classified in PET and nuclear medicine, we should all be thinking about this. Um, so uh, this is a team from um, uh, Guys and Tommies. And uh, they're using this machine here and this novel way to check for tumour margins. Uh, so they're um, uh, uh, taking out the tumour and trying to get really good margins because 20 25% of breast conserving surgery patients require re operation due to incomplete margins. Uh, and using this technique of novel luminescence, uh, you can check the tumour margins at the time. So that's great. However, uh, they, uh, while they were doing this, trialling this machine, they also looked at the, uh, the staff doses, which was very important, uh, for 20 patients, and concluded if a single surgeon and scrub nurse were doing them all, they would exceed public dose constraints. So that is definitely something that we should be thinking about when you're doing trials. Uh, and they conclude the workload needs to be shared and further monitoring is required, which I would agree with. Uh, so this is a, uh, uh, another part of the uh, series of uh, posters out from the Royal Surrey. Uh, uh, I don't know who Mr. or Mrs. Smoke is, but they're on the top of a few of these. Uh, I don't know if they're here, but ah, uh, oh, well done. Well, we'll give you a round of applause at the end. There's some good posters you've put together here. Well done. So I love this one. So. Um, 
they've moved, uh, they changed their protocol to a single scan uh, with um, a prediction of uh, baseline counts for a CCAT study instead of getting them on the camera. And sure enough, as soon as they started doing that, patients started asking them, why on earth have I travelled all the way into the department so that you can hand me a pill, some water, and I walk home again? Yeah? Why don't you post it out? All my other pharmacy gets posted out, and this is a pain. Uh, obviously, in your head, you're thinking, we're just not going to do that. However, they've gone through a process. Yeah? The activity is low enough to be exempt. Yeah? Uh, and they've looked at all of the issues, and they can see that this is a patient, this is the starting patient premise, and these are the issues that they've looked into, so this is difficult. Um, and they found some solutions to these issues. Yeah? You could get a locked box with a code, right? You get a courier and ring the patient, make sure they're in, get the courier to take it to the patient, and then do the interview over the phone, and then give the patient the code, they can unlock the box and take the tablet. And you go, oh, that solves some of these problems. Um, so they're getting down this line here, and then they speak to uh, some inspectors, yeah? And they speak to the Environment Agency Inspector. There's a great quote on here. Uh, and the Environment Agency Inspector says, just because a source is exempt, it doesn't mean it's exempt. We deal with a large number of incidents involving exempt sources. Please make it very clear in your procedures who we should prosecute when one of these capsules <laughs> is lost. <laughs> I mean, they're not hiding the facts of what they think about this, right? Uh, yeah. And the radiation protection advisor, a little bit more succinct, definitely a bad idea, but an interesting exercise. And again, I would agree. So, um, uh, this is why I love the BNMS. Look, uh, this is an Excel based dose calculator for carers and comforters. Yeah, and this has come out of Birmingham. Uh, and the author here, Bill Thompson, he got an award for being such a good guy and a great person for the BNMS, and he's still doing his work now. So, well done, Bill. Um, so, let's try to explain the dose and the risk uh, to comforters and carers uh, and their mitigations. Um, it, sometimes it can be useful to play that out. And they've got a, uh, an Excel uh, spreadsheet here, and you can change uh, the uh, if you modify the behaviours, you can change the distances and change the final dose to the comforters and carers. And you can show them, we've got a worked out example here where you dramatically use simple measures and dramatically reduce the dose as we know you can. Um, and so it's a really nice way to visually demonstrate how you want the comforters and carers to behave and what the consequences of that are. Uh, and what I really like about it is freely available. If you want that, email Bill Thompson. And that's why I love the BNMS, because we share. That's brilliant. Thank you, Bill. Um, so this is uh, from London. Um, this is a problem that uh, I come from part of the image optimization team, uh, and we look at DRLs in CT, which are nationally published, and that's uh, great. However, we don't have DRLs in musculoskeletal spec CT. So they've used 600 and uh, 43 CT scans, and they've given some data there so that they base their local DRLs uh, off those. And actually, they're there for all to see, and I think it's a good place that you might want to start uh, if you're setting your own local DRLs. I've managed to put four acronyms in one title there, by the way. Um, it's classically medical. CT, DRLs, MSK, and uh, SPEC CT, which is uh, it's, yeah, terrible. It's not med anyone not medical, I apologize. Ah, uh, yeah, so this poster, right, I subconsciously think I might have chosen this out of guilt. Um, I, I, I'll take you back to, I was a trainee, okay, back in Southampton, back in the day, this was years ago, and the medical physics team kindly put on a series of lectures to help us get through our FRCR part one examination. We need to do a physics topic, and yeah, brilliant. So they're helping out, we have a lecture on dynamic line phantoms, yeah, in QC. I don't know if we'd had a social the night before. I don't know. Maybe I just had a young family. Maybe there was no excuse. Anyway, I get 20 minutes in, and I'm just starting to struggle. It's all good stuff. It's required for the exam. It's well presented. You know, they're, they're, they're smashing it at the front, right? But struggling. We're in a small room. It's hot. It's after lunch. There's only six of us, right? There's three of us, and then three behind. I'm sitting in the middle. I'm thinking, I'm starting to nod here. This is going to be embarrassing. 
I look to my right and my left, and both people have fallen asleep. Oh, oh my lord, I'm in real trouble. I definitely, definitely cannot fall asleep. And then it just got worse. And then I couldn't concentrate on anything. I was pinching myself, that's quite good. Biting my lip, that doesn't really help. Uh, at one point I pulled out a nose hair, that was good. That was two minutes of all oh, that was sore, I'm awake. Yeah, I, I look back and I think, what was that physicist thinking? I mean, she must have seen me pull out my nose hair, and what was she thinking? <laughs> it's just awful, it's cringy. And uh, I bet she was thinking, why does he just go to sleep and I'll go and have a coffee, I'm plenty busy enough, and I'll see this lot of idiots for their retakes. Yeah. Anyway, so that may be why I chose this. Very bad. Um, the other reason I chose this is a really nice uh, demonstration of collaboration with industry. Uh, we've got lots of industry colleagues here today, and they've got so much knowledge and ability to help us, uh, and we can work together. We can't do anything without them, and they without us, and we're a team. And so they've, this team have had a, a problem. Their old line source is uh, failing, and it's a cobalt source, and they want a more clinically appropriate source of technetium. And so they work with Leeds test objects and they uh, iterate an ergonomic design together. Uh, and then using that, they, they are able to uh, find some problems with their uh, machines that have passed QA, QC before, um, some uh, septal thickness variations uh, and some other issues. And they give some nice examples there. So uh, good, uh, good work. So we hear uh, in various talks about how AI will help us report, but I suppose this just highlights that AI is going to um, come into all sorts of parts of our life, and in particular relevant to our work, it'll come into all sorts of parts of our processes, into bookings, into vetting. Uh, here, they're using AI to predict uh, PET-CT referral rates. Um, I mean, uh, 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 and this will go on. I imagine by next year, our chat GDP, TTB will be writing this talk for me, and probably the year after it will be delivering it, um, which will be a great improvement, I'm sure. It might have a slight American accent, but it'll be good, better. <laughs> but it's coming to us all. So, um, there's two reasons I put this in. Uh, one uh, was, uh, this is a tricky area, I find. Uh, pancreatic carcinomas, often there's very little kind of fat in the upper abdomen, and it's difficult to tease it all out. And as they uh, give good examples here, there are a number of inflammatory pitfalls that you can fall into when you're reporting this. And we find uh, contrast enhanced PET-CT helps. Um, nevertheless, a difficult um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, diagnostic um, problem sometimes. Uh, and the other thing, the other reason I put it in is from, uh, it's from my uh, colleagues in Bristol, uh, Randy, I think you're in here, uh, yeah, are oh, waving, great, and so big up the West Country, uh, just putting it in as our local neighbours and friends. Uh, so, how long should dynamic sensor nodes be? So the Christie have looked into uh, theirs. They were using a 30-minute protocol, and they thought, maybe we're doing that too long. Uh, and they followed a similar kind of process to what well, we might follow in my hospital. First of all, they look at the guidance, and that says you might come a bit you know, shorter and your times. And the next step was to look at other departments. And we do this a lot. When I'm you know, discussing well, whether you should change a protocol, it's really helpful to know what the surrounding hospitals are doing, what other people are doing. Um, I remember recently sitting in a NUCMED uh, governance meeting where we were talking about neonatal thyroid scans um, and uh, whether we should be using iodine or technetium. We use iodine, and some of the other local hospitals use technetium. And we're like, oh, well, I don't know what to do. And our head of um, nuclear medicine, uh, I saw him, you know, turns his mic off. And I can see him pick up the phone, and he comes back on five minutes later, and he's like, right, Southampton use tech, Gosh use tech, Oxford use iodine. I was like, right, that's really useful information, right? And I'm really grateful to the people that picked up the phone and gave us that information. Because I'm sitting in the Nuclear Science and Governance Committee, and I'm going, right, I've got a real feel for the landscape. Uh, and similarly, this team here, um, they've you know, gone out, and they've got six replies from the GB and one from AU, which I'm guessing is Australian, but it might be Austria. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, so there's international people replying to these questions. It's really helpful to us to share our knowledge uh, with each other, share our protocols, uh, and it helps us all, and ultimately it helps our patients and keeps us safe. 
Uh, so they reanalyzed uh, their uh, on the basis of uh, you know backed up by what's happening in the guidance in these other departments, and they've settled from a 30-minute to a 20-minute acquisition. And then they looked at their time, 55 hours of staff time saved a year. And that's a yeah, great bonus. So here is a well put together poster uh, from India, it's from New Delhi. Uh, 120 patients looking at their scan positivity uh, in PSMA. And it's got some nice examples. I recommend you to go and uh, take a look at it. So uh, this is from an uh, August team in the south of England, uh, namely Bath. Uh, this is you know, something that I'm on, and I'm not just putting my own work in. Uh, Abigail, who is a medical student with us, who I think is here, uh, put a really nice poster together uh, from the work we'd done. Uh, so this looks at um, 4,000 scan reports and found 82 patients had incidental parotid uptake. Um, 32 of those had pathological confirmation so we could figure out what they were, and five were malignant. So it gives you the kind of scale of the problem. And this isn't something that we can certainly ignore. We should be reporting focal uh, incidental parotid uptake. Um, but it, yeah, and there are some cancers out there, but you know, there's not a huge amount of cancer, and most of what we see is benign. Uh, the other interesting thing is the benign lesions had a higher SUV max. Uh, so your prostate adenomas, your Warthin's tumours are more FDG avid uh, than your malignant lesions. Uh, so do we need to scan the legs uh, in uh, oncology bone scans? So um, uh, this is uh, out of uh, the team in London again, uh, 206 patients, they're doing a two or three bed uh, spec CT and then plain R's of the legs. Uh, and we recently published on this uh, using whole body spec CT uh, and we recommended doing just this if you're on a standard gamma camera. Uh, however, they thought that, that, well, they found 38 uh, abnormal, which is mainly arthritis, um, uh, but only 1% of those were malignant and no case of isolated metastases in the legs. We found about 5% malignancy. Um, but we were using the lesser trochanters and they've gone a bit further down the femurs there. So um, I, I think this is a debate. I think you can play it either way. Um, in PET-CT we don't scan the legs, fine. Um, in bone scans we always have. Um, I think if you can adjust your protocols and get enough time to get another patient in that day, then I think you, know, you can make a strong argument. I think if you're not actually gonna get, if you're, recons are going on during that time and it doesn't make any difference and it's only going to be five minutes to do the scan, then maybe carrying on doing the legs is the right thing to do. And I, I think that comes down to a local decision. Uh, but you need to weigh up all the factors. So here's another staff dose reduction. Uh, they were trialling uh, a, a new uh, transfer technique uh, with grab sheets to try and reduce their staff dose. And as I said, you know, now pet workers are classified, this is important. Um, and they found a few things. So if the BMI is greater than 30, they advise using four handlers rather than three. It reduces the time and dose, and they've measured that. Um, interestingly, you get a higher dose received at the top of the bed, which I suppose makes sense. Um, but rolling on from that, I'm now envisaging up by the head end, you should have your kind of retire and return pay, um, you know, worker, and then you're going to have a gradation down, and you're going to have your kind of, I don't know, the working student maybe on the, on the feet. <laughs> Everyone line up in age order, be like Cubs games. Um, so the expected exposure time inversely proportional to patient mobility and dependency, and that's as we would expect. <coughs> So, Mr. Spoked again, well done. Uh, I like this classic physicist in action. It's got all the elements. Uh, it's got spreadsheets, it's got modeling, it's got vast amounts of data. Uh, and they've uncovered QC intolerances uh, and suggested further work. It's got it all. Um, <laughs> the title's great. Simulating gamma camera uniformity, wait for it, wait for it, in Excel, exclamation mark. That's brilliant. Uh, so, the, uh, you know, it, looking at uniformity, you know, in, in all seriousness, uh, takes a, a long time. And if you want to figure out those margins of when you're looking at a uniformity image, what does it tell you? 
um, you know, what are the errors and where, what are your set points uh, around when you're calling things, hang on, something's gone wrong or that's just random noise. Uh, and actually using an Excel spreadsheet, instead of doing hours and hours of floods, you can generate all of these things and then use your eyes and really get a feel for what um, uh, uh, non-uniformity looks like. Uh, and they've got a great training tool down here where there's various things and these are covered up and you can try and test yourself and see what you think. Uh, and uh, uh, what I really like is this, uh, I don't know if any of you do this uh, be real thing. This is like a physicist be real, right? He's looking forward at the screen there at the, universe, uh, at the uh, uniformity and then behind him is a swarm of physicists with this exciting uniformity view trying to figure out what it is. Uh, it's great. So, reclassifying recurrent thyroid cancer. Uh, so again, uh, this is a really nicely put together poster. 836 patients of so big numbers, 38 underwent operation, and they were uh, reclassifying recurrent and, uh, to persistent uh, uh, patients. And I'd like to just say this is uh, from Dubai. And I'm really grateful that the team uh, earlier from India that I showed and Dubai have made the effort not only to come over to the conference and hear the talks, but to contribute and share their knowledge and wisdom with us. So um, thank you very much. Uh, it's well put together. Do we need to worry about insulin findings in prostate cancer? So I have to, yeah, um, conflict. Yeah, this is me. Uh, well, it's not me. This is Basil, our student, who's here. Uh, I don't know exactly where he's sitting, but I'm sure he's in the room. Uh, and he's put together a really nice poster here for a team uh, with uh, David and myself. Uh, 5,000 uh, cases uh, um, we looked at, and this is on the back of the urologists. They were kind of whinging at us that every other week we found someone with prostate uptake, and often it was nothing, and we were just clogging up their MDT for no good reason. So. Um, we looked into this and, I mean, they're kind of right because we found 120 reports with focal prostate uptake, uh, 35 of those were investigated and that big gap there is because most of these patients have aggressive uh, cancer or they may be on a palliative pathway, uh, but either, any which way they've, been, they've gone to the urologist and they've not been further investigated. Um, for uh, cases uh, were diagnosed with prostate cancer and two of those ended up getting radical treatment. So of the 120 that were found out of 5,500 reports, only 1.6% uh, had radical treatment. So, I mean, this is something we should report, but you need to put in balance, really, uh, uh, of, of the patient and their clinical uh, scenario as to whether uh, you're really going to go down that um, uh, the uh, line of, you know, um, significantly investigated. So, another UK-wide survey um, and 52 responders. And I'd like to thank all the responders again. It's really important uh, that we share information with each other. Uh, and this team uh, got all that information uh, uh, looking at uh, brain imaging and quantification. Uh, and one of their uh, take-homes was uh, they'd like uh, scanner agnostic normal databases uh, and that would be really helpful. Uh, we're all sorry again. So, uh, this is a real incident uh, rather than a water bomb. So, uh, they had an incident where a toilet got blocked uh, and there was a 60 litre radioactive spill, which they document here, out into the hospital corridor. And you could see this happening. And you can imagine going for the spills kit and coming back with two ENCO pads. Um, it's not going to do it. So they used uh, 100 incontinence pads, three hours uh, of uh, wading around in this, and created 300 litres of solid waste. Yeah? And they thought there must be a better way of doing this. Um, so uh, they, um, what they learned from that was incontinent pads are not very good. Uh, and they also learned that people walk past cordons, so they need manning. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I think if when you're manning the cordon, you tell the person who's about to walk through the radioactive spill that they'll have to give you their shoes that will be covered in radioactive urine and they won't get them back for a week, that might stop them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they tested a water vacuum. Uh, and you can see them uh, here having a test. Uh, and they've got two uh, buckets here with the water and the water vacuum here. And this poor chap here is soaking up with loads of ENCO pads. 
I'm just trying to guess which one of these might be the trainee and which might be the supervisor, right? <laughs> this is about two hours of soaking up and getting covered. This, one minute, <laughs> sucked up 20 litres, anyway. Overall, consider getting a water vacuum for large spills. I think that's a good thought. So these are just quick uh, teasers, because uh, there's plenty more out there. So uh, on this side here, we've got some nice results from radiother um, radium therapy in East London. In the middle, there's interesting lessons learned from Sheffield Department uh, redesign. And then there's thought-provoking FDG brain cases from Cumbia, Cumbria. So I will let you find out more. Uh, right, and that's uh, all we have time for. Thanks again for the poster uh, authors for the effort you put into your work. Uh, and sorry, I can't show them all. Um, and they're all kind of on the wall down here and in the main uh, exhibition hall. Thank you very much. So thank you, Stuart, for uh, distilling 111 um, posters into such entertaining. Uh, I'll just say one small correction. It's smart, not smote. But otherwise, don't worry. Chat GPT-5 will not replace any time soon. And many thanks. And token of our appreciation, Richard's going to present you with a little certificate. <laughs> Just a reminder, we now have a cake cutting in the exhibition hall and we're also going to announce the Innovative Team of the Year Awards. Thank you.